I plunged myself into the dumpster looking for my doll when I heard someone walk past. It startled me, but not enough to stop digging. I felt the outline of the toy in an engorged hefty, poked a hole with my fingers and yanked it free. A girl was standing by the edge watching. She lifted me out of the garbage and tightened her barrettes. She pointed to herself. Hiroko, she announced. I wiped the dirty doll on my eyelet jumper and invited Hiroko to the apartment by flapping my arms and pointing with my nose. My family had just moved to faculty housing in a college town in southern Germany for my dad's sabbatical, and we were planning to stay through the year. No English, she told me in German. Hiroko came over from Japan so her dad could teach in the Divinity School at the University of Tübingen, where my dad had a microbiology lab. Hiroko was gargantuan, like a cute man from the Siberian border. <laughs> she had bobbed hair, large alabaster teeth, and a vague corporeal rot from undigested mackerel. <laughs> she was also 11. <laughs> Mom, can I go up to Hiroko's? I shouted from the terrace. <laughs> I was unreliable at sports and stuck close to my mother. I watched the kids play in the field rather than join them. So when I met Hiroko, I met a soulmate in lazy isolation. Sure, she said, but be home for dinner. She opened the French door and asked, want a cupcake for the road? Okay, I answered, <laughs> loosening my belt. I ate one or two, bagged another few, and ran up the street to Hiroko's house. Hiroko wasn't used to eating things that weren't fermented in a well, and the sugar made her aggressive. <laughs> After I said hello to her mother, I saw Hiroko in the corner, scooping cupcake out of the wrapper with a thin mint. She studied me like a caveman to a gazelle hawk. I asked if we could play indoors near her mom. <laughs> Typically, we'd sit in the backyard of their house and choreograph dance moves. She had trading cards from a Japanese singing duo called the Pink Ladies, and when we weren't dancing, we were sketching outfits for the two women. After the sugar shock had worn off, we bundled our supplies and headed into the yard, the only private one on the block. The yard was next to a deep forest filled with mushroom caps and hulking pines. We never dared go in it alone. Kalistulin, you make pink skirt, Hiroko pointed to my outfit and then to the drawing paper. We adopted a sort of German pigeon. No, I said, we make stand-up song. I pointed to the tape recorder, hoping instead to dance. She turned on the music and lifted me off the grass. Hiroko, one time, I, it hurt. I looked at her fingers curling around my forearm. She proceeded to pitch me through the yard like a panda at a forced mating. <laughs> <laughs> she dropped me onto the grass and backed away. You, my nose of milk. I smell milk of you, she said. Her mother came outside and told her to apologize. She explained that Americans have a repellent dairy aura. I sat, <laughs> I sat back down on the grass and sulked. Hiroko released her nose and picked up the drawing pad. I got up, said goodbye, and trudged back home while Hiroko traced tiny black hot pants off the trading cards. During weekends, Hiro Hiroko and I would walk along old farm roads near our apartment complex. Cars would rattle through the gravel. We would move deeper along the grassy curb, but the car would always cut a large arc around us. Hiroko and I walked past our favorite elm, separating the road from a long ditch, and heard the ping of rocks on metal. An Audi thundered towards us, skimming the road's midline. And we both stared in apople apoplectic silence. Hiroko stood behind me and held my shoulders. I was terrified, more so she was going to push me in front of the car. I thought I should try to fling both of us backwards into the ditch, but instead I did nothing. Hiroko held me steady and said, good dog, when the road was clear. I was sweating through my shirt, but I loved the idea of being a little dog. I turned and buried myself into her chest. Hiroko, you is big, I said, trying to get her to carry me home. Kalistulin, you not big, she responded, patting my head. We both realized we just cheated death. You like chicken. Yeah, I like eat chicken. No, you like chicken person. I curled my hand into her fist. I, mom, want see. She make you smell like farm, Hiroko said, punching me in the gut. Okay. Whatever uncomfortable feelings I had for her just seemed to propel me closer. When my mom asked me how my day was, I just responded, fine. I didn't want to make her nervous, and I began to look at Hiroko as a big ersatz parent. 
Hiroko started walking Robbie and me to school. She didn't bother attending before we got to Germany, instead sitting in her living room all day studying Japanese workbooks. We brought her in with us for show and tell. <laughs> Hiroko decided to start coming to school to get out of pre-algebra with her mother. She would swing by her apartment in the morning and grunt. Then she'd take our hands and lead us down the stairs like old grannies. Her size was important, especially around stature-conscious German children whom we went to school with. Robbie was the school's star student, slight, genius, and gentle. Germany hardened him. Robbie got picked on during gym because his grades were so high. I took Hiroko by the hand after Robbie was shoved into a wall by some kids. Hiroko had been flexing her shoulders in the reflection of the cafeteria glass and missed it. <laughs> Hiroko, Robbie, go class. Boys hurt him. Okay, Kalistulin. I hurt boys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hiroko, with us cowering behind, led Robbie to his classroom and cracked her knuckles. The room got really quiet. Robbie pointed to the little assholes and Hiroko walked over and pounded her fists on the desk. Robbie slithered to a seat as she strolled out of the room. Hiroko and I retired to our bench near the library, ate seaweed squares and sketched pink lady outfits in our diaries. Mm -hmm. We could tell Hiroko things we couldn't tell our own parents. Robbie didn't want to learn a lesson, rather just be rid of the problem. My mom got a part-time job teaching English, and Hiroko and I would walk home alone from school through a little district called the Vana, or Tub. My brother stayed after to tutor kids in math. The district center had a grocery store, a place to buy stationery, and a bakery. During the American Thanksgiving afternoon, a usual Thursday, Hiroko and I picked up Laugenbrochen, a lye caked puff, and darted through the underpass that connected school to home. We ascended the steps to the edge of the housing complex. We finished our rolls, and Hiroko motioned skyward. Look, she commanded. She was pointing towards grad student housing. I never dared go into it since grad students seemed so focused, savvy, and old. The building was pallid concrete with a brick patio below, dotted with small spruce. I followed her gaze. A man pitched himself off the roof of the apartment building. I screamed. Hiroko stood in guarded silence and put a hand on my shoulder. We saw the body smack onto the bricks. The soccer team in the field next to us stood motionless. Some of the players dashed over, but it was futile. The building was 30 stories tall. Hiroko led me up the stairs past the body, shielding my eyes from the carnage with her hands. I could smell feces and blood. We hurried up the stairs, skipping them two at a time. You come, she demanded. I stole a glance at the body, but Hiroko yanked me forward. Her mother greeted us with some tea. We shook our heads no and walked into the yard. Taking her man hand into mine, she led me to the edge of the forest and sat us on an overturned tree. You okay, she asked, patting my head. Okay, I answered. Thank you guys so much.